Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Miller with you, back again with you this week. Uh, this week's lesson is going to be about jawless fish. For the past couple of days, you have been doing lessons on the chordates. The chordates are organisms that have a notochord to start with, but some of those chordates, that notochord turns into a backbone. And that's when we go into the subphylum called vertebrata. And the first class we're gonna look at in vertebrata is called Agnatha. Agnatha is more than just a class, it's actually a super class that has been around for about 500 million years. This more commonly called jawless fish, and as the name may suggest, these jawless fish do not have jaws. In fact, they do not have scales either, they're very smooth, and they do not have paired fins. Now, the lamprey may have one long dorsal fin covering part of its body, but they do not have paired fins. Now, these are the oldest of the vertebrates, and as I mentioned before, they've been around for about 500 million years, at least their ancestors have. And what's kind of weird about one of them, the hagfish, it really doesn't have vertebrate at all. It's more of what we call a craniate. It does have a skeleton, uh, and as both the lamprey and the hagfish, they have a skeleton that's made of cartilage. Now, cartilage is a much more flexible material than bone. Now, we do, we do have uh, cartilage in our bodies as well, in our nose and in our ears and uh, other places throughout our body. But when it comes to the lamprey and the hagfish, their whole entire skeleton is made of this very flexible material called cartilage. Now, there have been many different groups of the agnatha, the jawless fish throughout the years, but only two groups consisting of more than 100 different species exist today. Those two groups are called the hagfish, which has more than 70 species, and looks like this right here. And then there's the lamprey, which has more than 30 species, which looks like this right here. Taking a look at these individually, the hagfish, uh, is a scavenger, which feeds mostly on dead organisms, such as fish, worms, mollusks, and crustaceans. They live uh, primarily in salt water. In fact, they always live in salt water. And they secrete mucus to assist in movement and escape predators. You can see that this one here has tied itself into a knot because sometimes that mucus will actually clutter up their gill slits and they will actually tie themselves into a knot, pull themselves through the knot, clean off that excess mucus. That's why these guys are sometimes called slime eels. Now they're almost blind, but they do have a keen sense of smell and touch because of these little tentacles up here that you see on the head. And these things are also what we call hermaphroditic. They have both male and female parts, but only one set of those organs functions at a time. Unlike the earthworm, the earthworm, for instance, is a true hermaphrodite. They're both male and female at the same time. But when it comes to this, they can either turn on their male parts if there is a shortage of males in the area, or else they can turn off their male parts and, and turn to a female if there are not enough females in the area. So they are only one sex or one gender at a time, but they can be either gender. So let's watch a video here discussing the hagfish. Of the ocean dwells a bizarre looking creature. A fish so ancient it has remained unchanged for 300 million years. This is the hagfish. Its velvet smooth skin lacks scales and slithers along the ocean floor. It has a skull, but no spine. Tiny holes run along the sides of its wriggling body. Some for breathing and some for sliming. But its most bizarre feature is its mouth. Like something out of an alien movie. This jawless maw is made for mincing up dead bodies. 
Multiple rows of sharp teeth are packed on two bony plates. With a single nostril, it picks up the sweet scent of death. A feast has arrived. It has no fins, but its paddle-like tail makes light work of swimming. The hagfish latches on and its mouth goes to work. Flesh is ripped from the carcass and shoved down its toothy throat. Soon, it's a frenzy of multiple mincing mouths. And to keep other hungry onlookers at bay, the hagfish excrete copious amounts of slime into the water. A shy shark snatches one, but ends up with a mouthful of snot instead. In minutes, the hagfish will strip the carcass to bone. It may be months before they find another meal like this. And speaking of slime, see. let's continue on. Right inside these tiny white holes, they look a bit like mouth ulcers, actually. And that's where it makes the slime to protect itself. And you can see now why we needed such a big tank. Apparently just one of these fish can make enough slime to fill a bucket of water in seconds. So they, they produce a lot of this stuff just to make sure they don't get eaten by something else. I mean, it would put me off, to be fair. I'm not hungry. And one more thing about the slime. Future be made of? How about slime? I'm Anna Rothschild. And this is Gross Science. Hagfish are eel-like creatures that live on the ocean floor. They're ancient animals that don't have backbones or scales or even jaws. What they do have is slime and lots of it. When they're attacked, they can release about a liter of slime, which clogs the mouths and gills of their assailants, making them unable to breathe. The slime is composed of two parts. There's mucus and thread-like fibers, and these fibers are special. They're thin and act a bit like super strong silk. So scientists think they could be a candidate for the next eco-friendly, high-performance clothing material. You see, common high-performance fibers like nylon and spandex are made from petroleum, but hagfish thread is made of proteins, which would make it a great renewable alternative if we could find a way to mass produce it sustainably. The issue is that hagfish don't breed in captivity. So we can't set up hagfish farms where we could harvest large quantities of their thread, yeah. which I know would have been really awesome. Instead, scientists are hoping to genetically engineer other organisms, like bacteria, to produce the fibers. Now, you won't be seeing hagfish clothing anytime soon, but the researchers think that one day we might have hagfish stockings or bulletproof vests or maybe hagfish yoga pants. And personally, I can't wait for a future where I could work out in the slime of an ancient sea creature. Ew. And one last thing about the slime, as she mentioned, it does have a lot of protein in it and it can be eaten. In fact, sometimes it is used as a substitute cooking ingredient such as egg whites, because it has about the same consistency. Now, moving on, our next organism is the lamprey. Now, unlike the hagfish, which was more or less a scavenger, this is a parasite. 
and attaches to bony fish and sucks their blood and other body fluids. They are often filter feeders when they are very young. They may stay at the bottom of the uh, freshwater area that they were born in for maybe three, four, maybe even up to seven years. Like salmon, they live in saltwater habitats for, mo for a portion of their life, but they also are born, bred, and go back to freshwater to breed. So all types will breed in fresh water. So once again, let's take another look at another video here quickly. Paddlefish in this stretch of the river are heavily parasitized by silver lampreys, and almost every fish we, we every paddlefish we see has numerous fresh wounds, scars, and actual lampreys attached. I think our record is 11 or 12 on one fish. As young, lamprey are blind and toothless. They bury themselves into the sand. And there, at the river bottom, they lay in wait for up to seven years. When they come out, they're a changed fish. Their gill holes are fully formed. They can see. And they've grown a mean set of teeth. Rings of them. They even have teeth on their tongues. So they can rasp into the flesh of their prey and suck blood. Once attached to a paddle fish, they suck out as much as they can. They rarely, if ever, kill the fish, but they leave terrible scars. These beady-eyed bloodsuckers attach to bodies, snouts, even up into gills. And these are lamprey scars. You can see the teeth marks on them. The lamprey are driven to the paddlefish by a need to feed. No beauty contest winners here. And as you can see here are some lampreys attached to this bony fish. There's one right up and through here. There's another one attached here to the gills, which is a good place to be sucking out the blood since that's where the blood flows through to get oxygen. You can see another mark right here, which looks like another lamprey had previously been attached there. Oftentimes they do not kill the fish, but they do cause a real problem for the fishermen still. If you take a look at the mouth here, of the lamprey, you can see these rings of teeth right up through here. And they also have these other teeth in here, which will pull out and rasp right into it. So thank you for listening. It is now your job to go and finish the Google form. Uh, thank you, and we will see you soon.